Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Optive Theology Podcast. I'm Andy Schmidt here with Dr. Russ Humphreys and Jim Bendewald. I, I didn't ask you how to say your last name before we started. So did I get it right? You got it. Oh, I got it. Perfect. Okay. So um, today we're doing a podcast that I've been wanting to do for a, a, probably a year now um, on creation and how the earth uh, was created. And so we have these two special guests on, um, Jim and Russ. Uh, Jim, do you want to introduce yourself to the audience and tell them who you are? Sure. Yes. So I have a ministry called Evidence Press. I'm the director of the ministry, and we produce documentaries in favor of creation. At this at this time, we have five uh, documentaries that we've completed, and our most recent one is called Earth Battles. How old is it? And so that's appropriate for our topic today. Um, also, I have a Master's of Divinity. Uh, one other thing is I uh, enjoy talking about creation. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, Russ or Dr. Humphreys, I don't know which one you want me to call you during the Russ podcast. Russ is fine. Russ, all right. Yeah, you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Yes. Uh, I'm a retired physicist. I worked 22 years at Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I worked as a physicist. But uh, I am a young earth creationist. That is, I'm, I'm, I think that the scientific evidence is very clear that the earth is thousands of years old, not billions of years old. And I'd like to talk about some of that evidence tonight. And uh, one other piece of background is, is that I'm a member of the Creation Research Society, which is a society of thousands of scientists who uh, think that the earth is young and was created fairly recently, not billions of years ago. Great. That's perfect. So. I'm excited for this one. Uh, a lot of just to, to kind of open things up. A lot of the listeners that listen to my podcast are young college students and in their twenties, early twenties or whatever. And so they, there's been a big push, I guess, in like recent, I guess probably the last 50 years of like evolution and how you can, you can, you can read scripture and you can add evolution into it. And so I think that's kind of the viewpoint that I'm coming that I want to come from because I'm not, I don't believe in evolution, but I want there to be a rebuttal for it because I think that a lot of these kids are just being basically told that you can believe two separate things and bring them together as one. And so I'm, I'm really interested in hearing what you guys have to say um, about all this stuff. And I think that it'll be really interesting to hear what people say back and what, and what people have to say right back to um, what you guys say about it. So I guess I'll go right out the gate with the first question. Um, the first question I have written down is that most people believe in evolution, but what evidence is there for young earth creation? And I guess first, like what is young earth creation? Uh, either Jim or Russ can, can answer well, that. Right uh, if it's mostly about the evidence, I, I probably should answer that. Uh, young earth creationism, I think I already defined it. Uh, we think the, uh, that there's scientific evidence that the world, the universe, and the earth are only thousands of years old, not billions of years old. And uh, so there's lots of evidence for this. Uh, there's a website called creation.com. And if you look up 101 evidences, you'll get a list of over a hundred pieces of evidence that the world is very young. But I also have, uh, and you, I should have shipped this uh, to you, Andy, or Jim has shipped it to you, a, a PDF document that has a, a document called Evidence for a Young World. And it's got 14 pieces of evidence that the world is very young. So uh, some people think they can, uh, it's okay to uh, rearrange scripture so that it includes the billions of years. But I guess my main point is that's not necessary. The evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of a young world, not an old world. So on this uh, document called Evidence for a Young World, there are a few items that are really very simple. Uh, uh, 
for example, item number four, if uh, your listeners can get that document and pause and uh, download it, it's yeah, item I'm gonna number have, four. Just so they know, I'm going to try to put the documents in a link beneath the podcast so you can oh, kind of okay. follow along. So I'd advise uh, right now pausing uh, the podcast and downloading those documents because I'll be talking right out of those. And the second page is called Not Enough Mud on the Sea Floor. And then at the top of the third page, there's a picture of mud sliding off a continent and into the ocean and piling up at the bottom of the ocean. And underneath it, a subducting, that means sliding under or lead under, a plate of rock. And it's slowly sliding under the continent at about a few centimeters per year. It's about as fast as your fingernail grows. But uh, every year, about 20 billion tons of mud come off the continent. They come off as dust storms and as sediment in rivers. Uh, and it's deposited on the ocean floor. Now, if you smear out all of that mud uniformly from shore to shore across the ocean, it would be about 400 meters thick, a little more than uh, oh, three football fields, let's say. So uh, that's actually not very much mud, considering that this process, according to evolutionary geoscientists uh, who think the earth is billions of years old, they think this process of erosion and mud and de depositing on the sea floor has been going on for three billion years. Now, the earth is supposed to be four and a half billion years old, but the ocean and this erosion process is about three billion, billion with a B. Uh, so uh, now the problem is that if this process had been going on that long, uh, there would be huge amounts of mud piled up on the ocean floor. It would be dozens of kilometers thick. The ocean would be choked with mud. Now, there is a way to get, take uh, mud off the ocean floor, and that's by that subducting plate that you see in the picture. And uh, that can slide some of the 400 meters worth of mud under the continent and drag it down. Uh, so about 1 billion tons per year would be removed that way. But we've got 20 billion tons going in and only 1 billion tons going out. So uh, that's not enough. So at the rate of 19 billion tons per year accumulating, uh, it doesn't take very long to accumulate that much mud. It would be less than 12 million with an M years, and that's uh, more than 50 times less than the 3 billion years it's supposed to have been going on. So there's something really drastically wrong. Now, the creationist view of all this is that most of that mud was deposited during the Genesis flood when, uh, when the waters uh, running off the continents, eroded huge canyons into it and, uh, and dragged a lot of mud into the ocean floor. And you can account for all of the mud that's there uh, with that one event, the Genesis flood, uh, occurring over just about one year, about 5,000 years ago. So, so I, have a, I have a quick question. How yes. would an evolutionist justify that? Well, I've tried it on some evolutionists, and uh, uh, the one geoscientist I tried it on at Sandia Labs ran out of the room. <laughs> so they don't have anything. No, he was, he was so uh, full of himself, he thought he knew the answers to everything. So uh, he heard me discussing uh, this particular fact uh, with another scientist there at the lab, and he burst into the room and started uh, asserting uh, that, uh, no, no, you're all wrong, Humphreys. And so I said, well, what about this? And, and it, so I just uh, brought him through blow by blow with the very things that I raised up to you. And he ran out of the room. So, so nothing, they don't have it. I mean, that, that's, that's one thing. Cause it was interesting. Cause I, so to prepare for this podcast, I listened, and I don't know if this is, I don't know what you guys think about this, but the Bill Nye versus Ken Ham debate that happened in what was it, 2014, 
Um, and it was it was interesting to listen to it because uh, it felt like there were certain points that Bill Nye and and maybe a lot of evolutionists just they they bypass and completely ignore as if like Ken Ham didn't say it. And so I, I that's interesting that you said that because I would th- you would think that they would have to have a rebuttal for certain arguments that are this big. I, you know what I mean? It's just interesting that that there was there's nothing. No, there. I, uh, the background to all this argument is that uh, uh, creationist scientists are not allowed by the evolutionary uh, publishing establishment uh, to publish this data uh with the implications so uh, a lot of it is published in the scientific literature but it's not flagged to say look here fellows this means the earth is only thousands of years old uh, so uh, they will not uh, publish this uh, they're they've been censoring us now for oh since since the 70s uh so uh, let me ask you know, so their answer their answer to the to the question is uh, shut up and don't say that. <laughs> so. Yeah, let me also add that I think that their position on the flood is such that they really don't want to include flood type of data or uh, ideas to enter into any of their theories or any of their, you know, their works. Can you help me here? Russ? Well, uh, most of the geology textbooks uh, for uh, the 20th century, uh, most of them would start off with a little introductory section saying, no, no, Noah's flood did not really happen. (laughs) We think that all these sediments were laid down over uh, millions of years and not suddenly in one year. So, uh, so they, they start off, uh, uh, with their bias showing so jim you said you had a you you had a written out answer to that to that question did you want to read that uh the one thing i was thinking of adding is that uh in addition to the to the concept that god created uh over six thousand years instead of billions of years god created out of nothing uh in fact that there was no pre-existing material in his creation and god created it um, as Russ said, about 6,000 years ago in a span of six days, over six days, and they're six 24-hour days. Mm-hmm. So so and, wait, real quick. Go ahead. Six 24-hour days. So, so how do you get the 24-hour out of Genesis? Because this is a big thing that a lot of young people are like, yes. how, okay. how do you know it's 24 hours or how do you know that you it's wanna, not? You want to do that, Jim? Or no, you I've had a lot of practice yeah, doing it. Yes. Uh, first in Genesis 1, uh, there's this uh, definition of a day, uh, what a day is. And he says there was evening and morning one day. And before that, he said, uh, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. And it's uh, shaped in the Hebrew as if it's a definition, as if this God is saying, this is what I mean by one day. And then uh, all the other days of creation have that same phrase. There was evening and there was morning the second day. And there was evening and morning, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, these elements are there right in the beginning. Light, darkness, day, night, Mm -hmm. evening, morning. Uh, And uh, if he's not talking about a day, he sure went out of his way to confuse us. Yeah, <laughs> but then there's another clincher verse I like to use. Uh, and that's in Exodus chapter twenty, verse eleven, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. He said, uh, uh, "For six days, uh, uh, well, for in six days, God made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and on the seventh day He rested. Therefore, you shall see, keep the Sabbath day." holy. And then before that verse, he also mentions days of the week, right in the verse before that. So the context of Genesis chapter uh, 11, chapter 20, verse 11, 
is ordinary days of the week. Yeah. I would like to add something. Uh, and that is that the word day in Hebrew, yam, is actually there's three different ways to uh, understand that word in Genesis chapters one and two. Uh, Russ mentioned two of them. So in, I believe it's uh, Genesis chapter one, verse five, it refers to day as in contrast to night. So it is, um, it is not a 24 hour day in that, in that verse. It's referring to daytime. And then he called it day in contrast to, uh, you know, I, I go to sleep at nighttime. I work during the day. Yeah. And then the numbers that Russ was talking about. So there was the first day, there was the evening and morning, the first day and the second day and the third day. That also is Yom, and that is referring to a 24-hour day, a solar day. And then the third use is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, I believe. I wrote it down somewhere, which I can't find at the moment. And so it says that it's in context of that in, in the – it's kind of like the, the context of the week. He's speaking of uh, the – that in that day, sort of like you might speak of your grandfather's day, such and such happened, uh, you could buy a Snickers bar much less than you can today. In fact, in my day, when I was a young man, you could buy a Snickers bar for five cents. Mm -hmm. So how about the, the old, like, ba back in my day, you know, that, well, you know back in my, yeah. what he said in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 yes is uh these are the this is the account of the heavens and the earth in the day that god created them i believe uh so but that in the day in hebrew is uh is the word yom with a b sound in front of it bayom and it's used elsewhere in scripture to mean at the time so it's a hebrew way of saying at that time so, uh, so you have these three different ways of using uh, yom, and our English is very much like it, like Jim was saying. Uh, uh, in my grandfather's day, it took three days uh, to cross the state of Texas. Uh, uh, so anyhow, During the, day the word day in English is, has kind of the same spread of meaning, but when it's used with a number uh, and uh, in the context of evening and morning, uh, day and night, light and darkness, um, it's pretty clear. It just means one rotation of the earth. So, oh yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah. So, uh, the context is really important. So how do you, how do you know which, which way to interpret it? Well, you, you know, by its context. And also something that's very important to understand is that Genesis one is the only place in the Bible where the word day is controversial. You could go to uh, the, the story of, of Joshua, where God commands Joshua and the people to march around around Jericho for seven days, and there's no controversy. You know, they're not saying, well, do you think yeah. it's 7,000 year, 7, years? No. Yeah, 7 billion years. They yeah. had a no, it's, yeah. no, it's very clear. It's seven days, and, it's, and the Bible is very clear, uh, actually, in Genesis chapter 1, as well as in other places. And so... Yeah. You could ask, here's a general question you could ask somebody uh, regarding their motives and ask them this. Let's suppose all the scientists, uh, not all the scientists, but generally uh, the mass number of scientists believed in uh, that the earth is only 6,000 years old and was created and happened in, in six days. Would Could you find uh, a creationist to be able, that would dispute that? that would try to find evidence then or claim that there's evidence for an old earth. They wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? So yeah. if you just switched it around and you, and right. they have, uh, a, yeah, they have a different motive. So, well, that's, I think that leads like into my next question because this is, I mean, this is what's absolutely ridiculous to me is that there's been such a push in American, in the, I guess the American churches 
and in college ministries and campuses that are trying to like conform to the culture. Because if, if you go out in public and say that the earth was created in six days, you're going to be called crazy. And everybody's going to say, you know, the science tells you that that's not true and whatnot. So they've been basically doing for the last, I don't know how long or when it started, but throughout my lifetime, and I'm only 21, that there's been, there's been a ton of push for, well, you can have evolution in the Bible, but everybody that I talk to that knows Hebrew says that's not really even possible based off of like the language of scripture and the text. And so my question um, that I, that we have written down is why do so many people, including Christians, especially Christians believe in evolution like what, what how can that even be possible um if this text in scripture and the hebrew literally says that that's just not true that a day is a 24-hour day well can i give you uh, uh my experience on that at the national labs absolutely i i found uh, that uh the scientists there most of them weren't creationists but some were uh but the scientists there uh did not believe in billions of years because of the facts they believed in the billions of years because they believed that most other scientists believe in the billions of years and they themselves had not done their homework but the irony is that they thought that the other scientists had done their homework so the whole idea of billions of years is just a big um, um, legendary snowball that's been rolling along because of intellectual inertia. <laughs> well, that's that's interesting because I so I've been talking to Tom Tom Flaherty about creation, and he's been on an earlier podcast. And he's a pastor here in Madison, and he he did a lot of research on uh, Darwin and. Charles Charles Darwin had a motive going into find like discover quote unquote like discovering evolution and he his daughter like his 13 year old daughter died and he was a Christian and so he was his his motivation was to prove like that God that a God didn't exist because he was in pain and now, so I think Darwin was never a Christian he wasn't no he was a th- yeah, he studied as a theologian, but uh, his you know, wife, whom he thought was a Christian, was really a Unitarian. So wait, explain. What do you what do you mean? I, I always was under the assumption that he was a Christian. Nope. Just look it up. He, he always had that inclination um, for a while. He uh, he gave sort of lip service to the Bible. Hmm. But if you read his biography carefully, uh, you'll see that he never uh, accepted Jesus Christ as his savior. So he merely took the first opportunity he found to deny that Jesus Christ was a savior uh, and uh, to deny that the uh, Bible was true. Uh, and uh, so he is working from that background. So he's, he was never a Christian. Interesting. I didn't know that. I'd like to address this question as well. Yeah, go ahead. So, so why do people believe in evolution? I think it's because the sources most people learn from assume that evolution is true. Uh, hey, they, they think that it's a fact. I mean, they say it's a fact. Evolution is a fact. It's in all our media. It's, it's in, on the TV shows in Hollywood. Uh, public schools teach, teach it as a fact. The universities, if you... If you were to come out saying that you believe in intelligent design, or even worse, that you believe in creation, you could lose your job, and or you could lose uh, your tenure. In a university setting, they there's an intimidation culture. It, it is a, a very serious. It's a very real. I have uh, people that that work at the University of Wisconsin here, and it's it's a very serious matter. Why did, why is it so serious? Is it just because people just don't want to recognize a creator? I mean, obviously, we know that there will be like persecution as believers, and and in America, I feel like it's more psychological persecution than physical persecution. But do you think that that's just part of like being a Christian in America? Well, so that you I mean, are you saying why? 
I, I'm not clear on what you're asking. Are you asking why do Christians, real Christians, believe in evolution? Or are you asking why does the rest of the world, who are not Christians, believe in evolution? What, which I'm, are you asking? I was kind of asking both of them, but I think, yeah, I think we should go into why do Christians believe in evolution? Because this is... Okay. Well, What's the, been Christian, the Christians uh, that I know who believe in evolution um, are uh, generally uh, fine people, uh, but uh, they have believed, they believe that most scientists believe in evolution in the billions of years. So along with the scientists I know who believe that, uh, uh, most Christians who are not scientists also believe that most scientists believe it. So uh, they feel that they have to uh, uh, rewrite uh, the words of Genesis and other parts of scripture that, uh, that talk about a young world and about no evolution at all. There's just nothing that looks like evolution in the Bible. Uh, they have to rearrange the meanings of words in order to accommodate what they think is true. So you see, it's, uh, it's mostly not doing their homework, or maybe, I hate to say it, maybe not having the courage to face uh, an unbelieving world uh, mm -hmm. that is so insistent on evolution and billions of years. So I, I, maybe, maybe that's a little too strong, but for some reason, they're they're buffaloed mm -hmm. by uh, the aggressiveness of of the ones who who push uh, the billions of years and yeah. evolution. So, so, so I, I, I think, in other words, the the real uh, surprise to me is that a lot of these uh, old Earth Christians and uh, evolutionist Christians don't want to see evidence that there was no evolution and that it's a young earth. They actually don't want to see it because that puts them on the spot. You know, mm -hmm. um, they are, they are going to have to take a stand. And I think they, they don't really want to hear that. So, yeah. So, so how, I guess how, do, how then does a young or, or an old Christian, defend oh i guess the question is like a young christian in the university setting how do they defend um create like seven day create or six day creation with the evidence and uh, i have another one yeah go ahead yeah. <laughs> and it's similar to the first one it involves the sea there's not enough sodium in the ocean so every year the oceans and other sources dump over 450 million tons of sodium by the way the back of the brochure has the references that you can look this up in the scientific literature or on the internet. Uh, so you can find this out yourself. So 450 million tons of sodium, that's, you know, one part of salt, uh, goes into the ocean and only 27% of the sodium manages to get out of the sea every year. So as far as anyone else knows, the rest of it, you know, say about two thirds of the, what comes in simply accumulates year after year on the ocean. And again, that sets a maximum age on the ocean. Uh, even if you account for ways the sodium might have gotten out faster in the past, uh, leaning over backwards to the evolutionary point of view, uh, you find that the, the ocean could only be 62 million years old or less. And the same thing applies about the Genesis flood, the same erosion of mud off the continents by the floodwaters leaving uh, the continent and going into the ocean would also erode sodium and other salts, uh, other parts of salt, other kinds of salt. Uh, so you could account for all of the sodium that's in there with just that one event. So even if God didn't create the seas with some sodium, uh, uh, the flood would have put it there. So uh, again, uh, this, you know, 62 million years is about 50 times less than 3 billion years. So there's something 
really seriously wrong with the billions of years time scale. And that's, Jim, an, did, that's an easy thing to understand, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's easy to understand, but it's hard when you're talking to university students who have been brainwashed their entire life. Um, Jim, did you have anything you wanted to say uh, I do. to that question? Yeah, yeah. So I would, I, I love Russ's answer and just his his whole paper, which has this particular one is uh, is fourteen evidences for a young a young world, and um, he's providing very direct evidence for. Uh, for the age of the earth. I have one that's probably not so direct. It's, it's more of a metaphor, but it may, some people may be able to uh, remember this. Okay. So it, it has to do with, with uh, DNA and information. So DNA is referred to as our blueprint or a blueprint. It's a code. In fact, it's the most sophisticated code node known to humanity. Now, if you were to go to a beach and out on this beach, you see a great big heart with the words, I love you, written in it. Would you ever think that that heart with those words came as a result of wind and erosion? Uh, you know, did it come from the waves? Did it come from, you know, some sort of a natural cause? Would you ever think that? No. I, you know, somebody had to write it. <laughs> yeah, somebody had to write it. Well, why is that, do you suppose? What 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 is it? intuitively that helps you realize that somebody somebody had to do that and that's not going to come about by natural causes well i think because of the order like there's there's order and there's like words and there's things that are working to like like when wind wind and water doesn't create like it needs to somebody needs to create with it it, it can't create on its own i guess you know what i mean yeah yeah so like maybe uh, waves could maybe produce something from a stick that might look like the letter I or something. But when you start adding in all three words with spaces, I love you mixed in there with the heart, you know, all of this mixed together tells us that this was created by intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, if you compare that, that simple little uh, metaphor with DNA, DNA is the most complex form of information known to humanity. Not only is it complex, but it's it's humongous. Um, I remember Richard Dawkins talking about DNA for for a single, I think it was a salamander seed. Is the length of it is like the length of the New Testament. You're talking about a lot of information. It's not just a sentence or two, and so. Uh, so to think about what is required then by evolution that has no intelligence in order to produce a code, a code that has four nucleotides. Well, who decided that it was going to be four nucleotides? Why isn't it six nucleotides? Or, well, or uh, that there was going to be nucleotides at all, or the, the fact that it takes three nucleotides for a codon to code for an amino acid. It's always three. It's never two. It's never six. Well, that's, that's like syntax, is that the, the kind of complexity that's inside our DNA is so complex. It has statistics. It has syntax. It has semantics. That if, if you were to uh, get enough mutations that it could affect the syntax such that a protein will either create a disease or it'll just simply be thrown out because it's corrupted. So inside our code is, is not only syntax, uh, which is like rules. So another example of the rules is like with an English sentence, we have an English sentence that begins with a capital letter, ends with a with punctuation. Okay. Well, it has this, you have something similar with, with DNA, you have beginning and ending codons. Well, that's like rules. And so there's just so much complexity built into built into DNA. And if you just you think about that metaphor of a heart out on the beach with the words, I love you written in it. I mean, 
hey, that could never happen by natural causes. So how is it that something so complex as our DNA or DNA for anything, even, even something as simple as a bacteria, could come about by natural causes? Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Let me add something about the DNA that not many people know outside of creation science. And that is that the DNA in living things is rapidly degrading generation by generation. Uh, you could only have about 200 to 300 generations of, of uh, replication of the DNA before uh, you reach a point where the animal is not able to survive. It falls off a cliff, so to speak. And uh, so uh, the human race, according to the Bible, is about 200 generations old already. So what's causing this decay is mutations, tiny little mutations. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of them, in fact, all of them almost, are deleterious. But they're tiny. Uh, but the effect of them piles up uh, generation by generation until uh, you uh, are just a species is no longer able to survive after enough of these have happened. Mm -hmm. That's in a book by John Sanford. He's a, a Cornell molecular biologist, uh, now retired, but uh, he, was, he was there uh, after he became a Christian uh, and then became a creationist a little while later. He was there at Cornell and he published this book called Genetic Entropy. So you can look that up on the internet, Genetic Entropy by John Sanford, S-A-N-F-O-R-D. And uh, so you'll find uh, that uh, uh, even the DNA has a time limit built into it uh, and it can't be old. Uh, it's, it's, you know, again, pointing to thousands of years for DNA to have existed on the earth, not billions of years. I'd like to add that Genetic Entropy is a great book. It's a fairly easy book to read. Mm -hmm. There's, it's highly referenced. Um, and John Sanford, as I understand it, I believe he started off as an old earth creationist. Yep. As a, as a, not, he started off with. Um, he started off as a, as a non-believer, accepted Christ. Then I think he wanted to, um, you know, like I was when I when I accepted Christ as a grad student. I tried to be uh, believe in evolution in the billions of years for about a year. I think John was the same way, and then he became a young Earth creationist. And I think the, uh, one of the big reasons was what his own research That's about right. DNA was telling him. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it's a really good book. And yeah. it's very readable. It's not uh, highly technical at all. So. He actually got his PhD here at the University of Wisconsin. Matt, hey. Yes. Okay. Well, he's a homeboy then. Okay. He's a homeboy. <laughs> so he's into uh, crops, but his book is about population genetics. And so he, <clears throat> he went on to the population genetics and it's, it's very, very powerful. The, the evidence. So, Okay, so I, I kind of wanted to talk and go into, um, well, okay, so so when you read scripture and and when you read like I think it's First or Second Timothy that says all scripture is God breathed and it's like ultimate truth. Um, I got a question from one of my friends who goes to UW. He's he has some science major. I can't remember what it is. I'll re I'll read it off to you guys. Um, he says that not everything in the Bible is meant to be taken literally. He says, obviously, context and cultural factors need to be taken into account. Also, the Bible was written in a way that the original audience would be able to understand. It's not meant to be read as a scientific uh, textbook. So why would we read Genesis as a scientific text? Um, and this seems to be like the argument, the, one of the main arguments that I hear from people who are Christians who also want to hold on to the evolution and old earth uh, billions of years. So what, what would you guys say to this, to this question? Cause I think it's, I think it's a good question. And I think a lot of young well, people, I, have I would first ask him why he thinks the Bible isn't to be taken straightforwardly and literally. 
Well, I, I have you, an example. You just asserted that it shouldn't. Yeah. I have an example that I could give you. And, and um, there, he, this is the example that he gave. So there's the example in, I think it's in Matthew, and, and it said, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed um, that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come um, and make nests in its branch, in its branches. And so we know that the mustard seed is not the smallest seed in the world. And so my friend said to me, do you think that some of scripture and some of what the Bible says is just so that the audience understands, because in that time, maybe the mustard seed was the, what they thought was a small seed in the world. So that, that would be an example of what he would respond. May I, may I comment on that? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, part of the verse said, uh, when it grows up, it becomes the largest of all the garden plants. Right? Yes. Okay. So the context is the kind of plants that are in gardens. Now, the small seeds that uh, your friend was probably referring to are not garden plants, uh, but they are things like orchid seeds and other flower seeds, uh, which aren't uh, really don't have the full structure of the seeds of the garden plants. Uh, they, have, they are sort of uh, uh, without a covering on them. Uh, but anyhow, uh, of all the garden plants, in the Hebrew, I'm sorry, the Greek word uh, for garden plants means vegetables, you know, things that, that grow as uh, things you can eat. Uh, and so uh, of all of those in that context, he said context was important. Uh, context is uh, garden plants. And of all of those, the mustard is the smallest. So isn't that a case to be made for just taking what Jesus said straightforwardly instead of trying to pick holes in it? I've never heard anybody say what you just said, but <laughs> when, when he said that to me, when he brought that point up to me, I really didn't know what to say. But now, I also, now you know. Now I know what to say. <laughs> Thank you. I, that's actually like really, really interesting and really good to hear because, yeah, I did not look into the Greek text. Um, and that's just super interesting. My mind is kind of blown right now. I kind of blew my mind. Jim, did you have anything you wanted to say about that? Yeah. Um, I, I agree with him in the sense that we should not read the Bible as a scientific text. It's not a scientific text. What we should do is we should read the Bible um, for its plain understanding. And so, you know, there's uh, hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a science and art of interpretation. And when we're in, when we're understanding something, when we're interpreting scripture, we are to uh, start off with well, what type of literature is this? You know, this is I know one of one of your other questions. I'm kind of jumping uh, jumping questions here. I'm going to try and stick to this one. So there's a colloquialism. So for example, uh, sunrise, sunrise, sunset. Is the sun actually setting? No, we use this in today's language, uh, sunset, sunrise. The sun isn't actually uh, setting. The earth is, is revolving around the sun. But it's, it's a type of uh, terminology that we use today. Now, if you were to think of this strictly from scientific terms, you go, oh, well, that's in inaccurate. But it's not written as a science textbook. It's written um, to ordinary people of its of uh, in its day and, and it, people understood it. People understood what was, what was meant. Well, I think, uh, one of the things to ask here is, uh, yes, it's not a scientific textbook, but when it touches on a subject, yes. Is it scientifically accurate? Hmm. Now, sunrise and sunset, uh, by the way, is scientifically accurate. In the reference frame of the earth, the sun rises and sets. So uh, in relativity, uh, everything depends on what reference frame you can choose, but you can choose any reference frame. So God used the reference frame of the earth because that's what we live in. And yeah. in that reference frame, the sun rises and sun sets. That's perfectly relativistically true. 
So I'm going to kind of shift because I, I just got a question in my that popped into my head that I think I want to uh, talk about. When when people are talking about old Earth, they sometimes bring up how the stars are the light from the stars have traveled billions and billions of years. And that's evidence that the universe is billions and billions of years old. Do you, what what is that? What's the deal with that? Wow. You just asked the million dollar question to the man, to the man right here. Russ Humphreys is the author of Starlight in Time, the book, and also the DVD with the same name, Starlight in Time. Take it away, Russ. Okay. Uh, I have that book, uh, Starlight in Time, back in 1995, was my first cosmology set to explain how God got the light here in a hurry. And I pointed out that it had to get here in a hurry as measured by clocks on Earth, and that relativity provides a way that clocks can tick at different rates uh, in different parts of the universe. And then I had a second uh, cosmology, uh, which also uh, took off from that. But I'm working on a third one now, which I think uh, is much more biblical uh, and takes account of much more scripture. But the bottom line of that is that I think that uh, God speeded up uh, the starlight uh, very fast for the first four days of creation out there in the heavens, while at the same time, uh, light was going at its ordinary speed here on the fourth day. And then uh, toward the end of the fourth day, when the light from those distant stars uh, was approaching the earth, um, he made even the light in the heavens slow down to the ordinary speed. That It's pretty clear when you actually go through the Hebrew uh, that he did that. Now, I don't know how he did that, but I do know that the speed of light is something that's under his control. Uh, uh, by changing the medium through which the light goes, you can control the speed of light. And so I don't know how he did that, but uh, Genesis chapter 1, when you dig into it, uh, is pretty clear that that's what he did. So he, what, he got what, the light here in a real hurry by speeding it up. What verses are you like talk, particularly talking about in Genesis? Uh, well, for example, uh, 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 when he made the stars on the fourth day, he said... Uh, uh, he made the greater light and the lesser light uh, to, uh, uh, to, to rule the day and the stars also. And he gave, he, he gave them to make light upon the earth and it was so. So it sounds like he got the light here in a real hurry as measured by clocks here on earth. Now there's another uh, another set of verses that talk about uh, uh, the heavens and how they started off small and got very big uh, by the fourth day, and they would have had to move out much faster than our present speed of light. So uh, material moving out at much faster than our present present speed of light kind of implies that the speed of light where that material was, was also very great. Uh, am I making sense? Yeah. yeah okay. that makes sense. Can okay, I... there's, there's more, uh, but uh, about uh, three strong indicators uh, that out there on, on the first four days, the speed of light was much greater than it is now. But when he converted uh, the heavens, slowed the light down in the heavens, all across the heavens uh, at the end of the fourth day, that conversion takes care of the problems that you would normally have with the speed of light being very great out there, but not here. So, it's, so is it kind of like the, the light appears to be, it, it, may, it appears that things are older than they are, but because it was sped up for the purpose of crea God's creation, the way he created the earth, uh, that appears differently than what it actually is. Is what is it kind of uh, what you're saying? Glad you asked that, because uh, a lot of people, unless you're a physicist who studied relativity, uh, you don't realize that there's a deep connection between the speed of light 
and the speed of time. So when light is fast, uh, time is fast. You could think of light bouncing back and forth between two mirrors. And each time it bounces is a tick of that light and mirror clock. Well, if the speed of light is much faster, that clock ticks much faster. And the same for all the physical processes. So I think God did that, uh, speeded up light out there in the heavens uh, uh, to accomplish several purposes. And one of them was to speed up time. So uh, we have billions of years worth, worth of events happening out there in the heavens on the on the just a very short time during the creation week so out there billions of years elapsed uh but here uh we uh it happened within uh less than a day so uh, when you're talking about time and and uh the speed of time and stuff like that it makes me think of i don't know if you guys have seen the movie interstellar yes i have I, it makes me think of that movie when they're traveling. They go down to the, go down to the one planet that, and they spend. They're there for like, like maybe an hour, but it's like twenty five years in. Oh our, yes. So yes, I, that's, I, that's time dilation, and it is connected with the speed of light, uh, uh, as well as the speed of the clocks down there. Uh, yeah, so that's a good illustration. Uh, it helps you imagine it. Yeah, Jim, did you have anything uh, you wanted to add to the to that? Yeah, this is a very complicated uh, question. It's it's the one question that I think that intuitively when people think about, well, how is it that these stars billions of light years away could appear to Adam and Eve? And intuitively we think, well, uh, it doesn't quite add up. And it almost fits into the category of old earth. And I think a lot of people choose old earth because maybe because of this, this very question. Yes. But Russ is, you know, he's a, I believe, nuclear physicist. I'm a general garden variety physicist, and I've dabbled in nuclear physics and geophysics uh, and cosmology and astrophysics. And uh, so, yeah, so I've dabbled. All right. So there is something that I think will help the listeners to grasp this topic a little bit more closely. And that is uh, for Russ, if you would help help the listeners understand gravitational potential energy and uh, in context with the two atomic clocks, one at oh, yeah. level, okay. one at uh, a mile high. Yep. So this is an illustration in my first book, uh, Starlight and Time, uh, but it points out uh, that uh, uh, clocks at mountain altitudes tick uh, faster than clocks at sea level. And actually, the, uh, the, the rate of ticking is enough different that the, um, you know, the National Bureau of Standards has to account for this. So the clocks uh, in Boulder, Colorado, 5,000 feet above sea level, uh, tick about five millionths of a second per year faster than the clocks, the same atomic clocks down at sea level. And, uh, and so the higher you go, the faster they tick, or the lower you go, the slower they go. Uh, and that's not much when you just cover a mile uh, worth of altitude difference. And that, by the way, boils down to an energy difference. You, you, it would take you uh, energy to lift that clock from sea level up to a, the mountain altitude. Uh, and it's the, that gravitational energy that enters into the equations, not gravitational force. So that's all in Einstein's theory of relativity. But, you know, microseconds per year uh, is not a big thing for us to worry about, but that's over just a one mile difference of altitude. What if you have a 20 billion light year difference of altitude? A light year is 6 trillion miles. And so you have 20 billion of those from where we are out to where uh, the last stars are. And so very important point now is that, right, we know, we understand that the universe, ooh, I don't know if you're going to agree with this, is the universe expanding? So if the universe is expanding, then at one time the universe was once smaller. 
And if the universe was smaller, then that has implications regarding the gravitational potential energy. Oh, it has lots of implications. So this, this is not a simple subject, uh, like Jim said, uh, but uh, we think we've got good answers to it. And if you don't like my three theories, uh, we have creationist scientists who are also physicists who have other theories. So uh, you have a whole bunch of theories to choose from. So uh, don't let the light getting here uh, on the fourth day from very distant objects uh, bother you at all. It's just uh, uh, you need to stretch your imagination just a little bit. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I I should probably read your book because I'm not I I I don't fully understand this stuff, but I also don't study it. Um, but it, Star, it, it, Starlight and Time is uh, mostly written for the layman. It does so, have uh, does have an, a, two appendices, one for the theologian and the other for the physicist. Uh, yeah. And the, the physicist one is mathematical. But the first part, uh, you know, the main part of the book is written uh, very clearly uh, by a friend of mine named Carl Whelan in Australia. Uh, he didn't want to take credit for being a co-author, but I've, I gave him stuff and then he rewrote what I said until people could understand it. So starlight and time is a, a good way to understand some of these things. Yeah, it is a very important topic. And uh, Evidence Press, uh, which you can find at evidencepress.com, is uh, a distributor for the Starlight and Time DVD. Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. That link will be in the in the description. Yeah, that DVD is a good one too. A friend of mine made it uh, in Albuquerque, uh, Mark De Spain, and uh, he really put a lot of good work into that. So uh, uh, it's better than the book. So get the DVD. Awesome. Starlight and Time from Jim Mindevold and Evidence Press. So, Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so I think I have like. I, I have like, I think this would be maybe the last question, depending on, on where we end, because we're, we're, we're coming up on about an hour. Um, but I think it's an important question. And we, I, we, we talked more about the evidence for um, a six day young earth creation. Um, what are some of the big holes in the theory of evolution and the Big Bang um, that the listeners can kind of think about uh, after they listen to this podcast? Some of the issues with the Big Bang and the issues with evolution. Well, one of the big issues with the Big Bang is that it uh, can't explain uh, how all this matter got here without having an equal amount of antimatter made. And so they've been looking for ways to produce lots of matter without producing an equal amount of antimatter. You know, that's, that's right there at the very beginning. And uh, they have not solved that problem. So what exactly is antimatter? Well, uh, antimatter is the opposite of regular matter. So uh, if you think about an electron that has negative charge and it's the lightest uh, particle in the atom, uh, there's another particle called a positron. Mm hmm which is, has a positive charge, but it has the same mass as the electron. And uh, when those two meet, they destroy each other and emit two gamma rays. So you, you, well, you remember your Star Trek, don't you? Captain, Captain, the antimatter containment fields are breaking down. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, that's that's great. I, <laughs> because, because when the containment fields break down, that antimatter contacts the matter, and boom, it blows up the starship. <laughs> so of course, you know that from Star Trek. Absolutely, right? absolutely, <laughs> for sure. I don't Star know. Maybe Trek. maybe you're too young uh, for Star Trek to be really etched into your memory like me. So I think I think Star Trek does a better job of explaining science than most public schools do. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Jim, did you have any, uh, any that you wanted to talk about as well? Yeah, sure. So let me mention one of our documentaries is universe battles, which features Dr. Humphreys. Uh, he, he talks about, and this is a, a topic we could talk about, but, um, is the magnetic earth's magnetic fields. And he also made predictions regarding, 
um, planets, uh, Uranus and Neptune. And it's all fascinating. You should see uh, universe battles just so you can learn about these things because Dr. Humphreys actually made predictions and they became, when these predictions came true, uh, they were proven to be correct. But uh, what I wanted to talk about in the early part of our documentary is the, the issues of the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And so um, let's see. I lost my place. No problem. Oh, by the way, uh, in this evidence for a young world uh, download that uh, people can make from your site, uh, one of the evidences is the Earth's magnetic field is decaying too fast. So that's a sample of some of the magnetic field evidence from the solar system. Yes. So right here on Earth. And mainly uh, the Earth's magnetic field is decaying away too fast uh, to be uh, any more than about 20,000 years old. So in fact, there's a lot of evidence that it's only 6,000 years old. So that's, that's item number six, I think, in this evidence for a young world article. Um, Very good. Thank you, Russ. So first and second laws of thermodynamics, uh, I suppose this can get a little bit in the weeds as well, I'll try and keep it not too deep. But um, so the first law is energy cannot be created or destroyed in an isolated system. And so that leads to the issue of, well, where did the, where did the universe come from in the begin in the first place? If you have a law of thermodynamics stating uh, you, uh, matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, where did, it, where did it come from? And the second law is uh, that states that, that the entropy of any isolated system always increases. Entropy, you better explain entropy. Yes. Entropy is the idea that uh, heat is always uh, being reduced or uh, breaking down. So if you get out of, out of thermodynamics, which is what I'm more familiar with, uh, things break down over time. Uh, matter breaks down over time. A car gets rusty. There we go. Uh, I get old. That's right. Our bodies, we, everything breaks down, including planet Earth, including the stars, including everything in the universe. It all is burning out. And so if it's burning out, so one of the things some people would say is that the universe has always been here, but it can't always have been here because the universe is burning, which means that at some point in the past, it had, uh, it had to have a beginning. Am I right? Yep. And so really, so because, so you, you have the first law that says, uh, you can't have a beginning. And then the second law says you have to have a beginning. <laughs> In order to solve the problem, you have to have a creator that is outside of the universe, outside of time and matter, and that provides the beginning. Basically, it's what it sounds like is that like all logical conclusions come to the... Uh, all logical, yeah. This all comes to the conclusion of that there needs to be a creator or a god, or or we're like in a simulation or something like that. But there has to be <laughs> some sort of outside, some uh, a being has to be outside of our time and space and our laws to have created us. Which is, I mean, that that was like the interesting thing because when I was watching the Bill Nye Ken Ham, every question that Bill Nye got about about like the origins of the universe it was always like well we don't know and like it was just it was just like we don't know like like we'll never know if you figure that out then then you'll be a famous scientist so was, i don't know it was it, it just felt like there was no answer and, and it just felt like they kept dodging the they, they wouldn't even take into consideration the idea that there could be a god and i think that that has more to do with the uh, more, more like to do with the fact that if there is a God, then they need to start focusing on things like hell and heaven and other things personally. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to take responsibility for that. And I think that that, I think, I think like when I'm thinking about 
uh, creation and stuff, I think a lot of it boils down to the fact that people just don't want to take responsibility for their being on this planet and they don't want to figure out, you know, why they're here. Because if you figure out why you're here, then you're going to have to start to take responsibility for your morals and for the things that you're doing here. And so it is, I think it is like extremely fascinating that, that, I mean, having God as the answer isn't actually as crazy. I would rather have God be the answer than nothing be the answer. You know what I mean? (laughs) So so it's interesting. Yeah. I'd like to add, you know, to this uh, topic of what we, what they don't know, what evolution and what the establishment scientists say they don't know. And that's, and that's the topic of origin of life. It's also described as abiogenesis. And so abiogenesis is this idea that life started in a prebiotic soup. And even with the best scientific minds, they have no real evidence for it. They only have just so stories. And they have actually evidence against it. And I'd like to mention some prebiotic soup that's on your, uh, in your kitchen. Uh, on your shelves, you have these cans of soup, uh, and uh, you go to the store, and there are more of those cans of soup, and uh, they have all the ingredients for living things to be to put themselves together in it. You know, they have uh, starches, sugars, fats, proteins, uh, amino acids, and water, and uh, and uh, so they, you know, they're. They're really pre- prebiotic soup. They're they're ready to assemble themselves into living things. But they yeah. don't. Uh, yes, every time I've opened a can of soup, I've never smelled the evidence or seen uh, you know really yucky stuff that indicates that life decided to start in there. Um, and uh, and think how how many trillions of can years uh, of soup that we have. Uh, accumulated over the last century, uh, that experiment's been done over and over and over again. And Louis Pasteur did that experiment a long time ago. That's right. And uh, so he's he would be saying, I told you so. <laughs> so, so. Well, I think that goes back to the story that Jim told about if you find, right, if you find I love you in a, written on the sand, you're not going to assume that the sand and the water and the wind created that. You're going to assume that somebody else created that. And, it, and, and when, um, you know, like when you're thinking about this stuff, yeah. When you open the can of soup and it's not already, the soup's not already made, you know, you're not really disappointed because that's how that works. That's how things work. And so if, if evolution was real and if some of these things were real, you'd think that you would see more, more like, things being created out of nothing kind of like you, you'd think that it would be consistent in our everyday lives that I'd, you know, drive down the street and a tree or a tree would just magically pop up in front of me or something like that. I I don't know, but that stuff just like doesn't happen. And so it feels like there is inconsistencies there as well, where it's like, wouldn't this just be a consistent part of our daily life if, if that's how things work, but it's it's not that I know of. I'd like to add, I have, there's times where I go to the university and talk with students and have conversations with them. And, and people will often say, well, you know, there really is no evidence for creation. I mean, that's just, that's (laughs) standard thought in their mind, but just this one topic that we're discussing right now, abiogenesis, where there's no evidence for uh, the life coming out of a prebiotic soup. And then the other side is biogenesis, where, as uh, Dr. Humphrey said, well, Louis Pasteur uh, confirmed this, and it's been confirmed over and over again. It is a law of biogenesis. It is something we see every single day in that life uh, begats life. Light, you know, so you have chickens that, that hatch more chickens. We have um, all these different animals, dogs that give birth to other dogs. And, and so this is seen every single day and it's evidence for the existence of God, that God created not just uh, 6,000 years, he created the various kinds, kinds of animals that we have today. 
there's a lot we could talk about. Believe me. Yeah, I know. That's kind. Of, I, I'm thinking through this, and I'm like, I'm like, holy crap! Like, like the more <laughs> that I'm thinking that the more that I'm like talking about this and thinking through it, it's like almost everything in science or in nature points to there being a creator. Like, like Amen. you know, people, your eyes like, are opening. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, like you know, I was in when I was in um, high school and. Uh, my freshman year in biology class, like I got I, my, my teacher failed me and kicked me out of class because I didn't believe in evolution. So like <laughs> I've, been, I've been fighting this battle for a while too, but, but right. Like, the, cause I never really get to talk to people who have literally like studied this their entire lives. And so mm-hmm. it's just interesting to hear. And, and the- most, most creationist scientists started out as evolutionists like I did and like John Sanford did. Uh, and we were, uh, brought to being creationist uh, by the scientific evidence. So. Yeah, and I think so. So I guess as we kind of come to a close in this podcast, I know there's you know yeah we could talk about this stuff for five hours and and it would be great, um, but but no but, but people would stop listening they'd probably get bored. Um, but I think I, I think I have one last question for you guys um, to the listeners is that like. Do you have a, uh, any encouragement or anything like that for, for anybody who's like, who, who wants to figure this stuff out? Because I know there's a lot of young people that listen to this and they might just not want to hear it right now. But I mean, do you have any encouragement or any resources or anything like that? that you can Yes. Get? Yeah. Now, Jim's Evidence Press has a lot of good resources. And uh, there is another good website. In fact, there are actually quite a few good websites, but this is the one I really like. And that's the one I mentioned before, creation.com. And that is just loaded with resources. It's got more than 10,000 very well-written article for the layman, uh, often written by scientists, but edited so the scientists are understandable and uh, well illustrated, and it's on almost every topic uh, that a person would need uh, their questions answered. So if you go to the top of the creation.com website and go to the Q&A tab, those are the questions and answers, uh, they'll, they'll find uh, all the topics that they want to, you know, probably find the topic that they want answered and find a bunch of different articles on that just that one topic so Mm -hmm. so that's a excellent resource for the college student it's it's right down their wavelength yeah absolutely you don't have to be a scientist uh but it helps (laughs) yeah i i have a resource i'd like to recommend the bible maybe you've heard of that Uh, (laughs) 20 romans 120 says for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. I think this is such an important verse for those that feel, well, maybe God just used evolution. And I ask, why would God say that he created in six days as he did in Genesis chapter one? And then, uh, actually make it look like he, you know, that he used evolution. Why would he make it, make it look like he wasn't even needed? It does not make any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and another thing that I think is very important that I've not heard anybody else talk about. And that is that God is a jealous God. Exodus 34, 14 says, for you shall not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Now, why is that important? Because we live in a world where evolution is treated as a religion. It is so encompassing. It it factors into everything. All of our media, as I mentioned previously, it's in, it's in our schools. It's it's uh, it it's in our government. It it factors into everything that that people think about and it is, it affects how people, how people think. And so it, uh, it has become, I believe it has become an idol. It has become a source of worship, but why would God allow 
want us to worship, uh, you know, something like evolution. He would not. God wants us to worship him. God uh, is a jealous God, and he wants us to worship him only. The creation points to who he is. The creation, as it says in Romans 1.20, that since the creation of the since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes and eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So the creation points to his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature. Can I uh, finish reading that one passage that you just touched on there? Uh, so they're with, without excuse, it says, the ones who suppress God. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That's evolution. I mean, I think that's really good. And I think I th I think uh, one thing that I always used to say, I guess I still do say it, is that like it, it also comes down to like a philosophy and a worldview where it's and I think that it's very damaging to kids. Is And I've seen it around my friends is that if you teach kids from the age of six years old all, all up, you know, through college that they're from monkeys why would what they're going to act like monkeys and so i and that's what happens i mean kids are like i i really honestly think that this this pushing evolution and that everything's like random and that your life kind of really has no purpose and has, has taken a toll on my generation and I, you see like the suicide rates are skyrocketing and you see like kids are dropping out of school and they're and they have no goals and, and they're not working and they're not doing things because they don't see any they have any purpose in their life and i think just for the sake of like for a young person, for the sake of just figuring out why you're on this earth, I think that it's important to look at why we like where we came from. And if you can figure out where you came from, then you can figure out your purpose and why you're, you belong here. And I think that this, I mean, seeking like the person who seeks the truth will find it. And that's what Jesus promises. And I think that if, if, if we as like believers are seeking the truth, I think God's going to, with an open heart and a humble obviously a humble heart, we're going to find the truth. And I think that it's important to, you know, for everybody who's young, including myself to be like, I've only been here for 20 years. I don't know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to go and I'm going to ask the people who have been here longer and I'm going to read their books and I'm going to research and I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to ask God so that I can know, which is basically the whole point of this, that why I started this podcast in the first place is that I think it's important for young people to, to look to the older uh, generations to teach them. And I think that that's kind of my little rant on, on, on this whole idea, but I think that it's important for, for us to look for the truth rather than, than, you know, what the world is telling us. Yeah. Um, other than that though, I think, I think we're, we're about an hour and 20 minutes in. So I think it's a good time to wrap things up. Um, I want to say thank you to you both for coming on the podcast. This is really awesome. And I really appreciate it. Um, and for, I'm going to try to put as many of the resources, um, that we talked about as I can, uh, into the, the, the link in the, or the bio for the podcast. Um, and then evidencepress.com, I'll put that in there. Um, so go check out, there's a bunch of different resources at evidencepress.com. I, I watched, there's the like 15 minute video, um, right in the front page that I watched. That's actually a really good video that you should check it out if you get a chance. Um, and then I'll have my website in there and we're going to have some stuff on my website, some, some content that you can go look at and like just keep doing research these guys have been doing this stuff for a long time so it's you know an hour and 20 minute podcast isn't really gonna give it give us all the answers but if you keep researching it and looking into it um i think you'll find more and more answers so did you guys have any final things you wanted to say or anything i'm, I'm uh you know worn out so you know, i've said everything i could possibly say so uh, I don't think it's been true. fun. It's been it's fun. True at all. Um, yeah, I would like to add that uh, I'm very proud of you, Andy. I think that this is uh, what you're doing is is absolutely fantastic, and you're a great model for uh, other other people uh, your age and and older. And I'd like to close in prayer. Yeah, absolutely. 
Father, just thank you for uh, this podcast and for Andy and how you are using uh, this message and other messages that that are being developed. Uh, Father, thank you for all that you have done and created that um, that we look to you, that you are the almighty God. You are uh, a God that we can fully trust and look to for for all of our all of our concerns and, and needs. And thank you for your creation. Thank you for its beauty and, and how it, it reveals to us who you are. Father, we, uh, we ask that you would uh, work in the lives of people who are listening, that there would be some that would come to true faith and a new faith and that they would maybe uh, invite Jesus into their life uh, right now, that they can do that just simply by asking uh, John 1.12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. We ask that for those who uh, strongly believe in an old earth or have continued to believe in an old earth, that, Lord, that you will give them new thoughts that help them to realize that your word is true and it is trustworthy, that this is an issue that deals with the authority the authority of your word from beginning to the end. And if we compromise in the beginning, we're going to be compromising along the way. Lord, help us as a people to trust you, to walk with you, and to obey you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, For the listeners, make sure to give us five stars. Share this with your friends. Um, All that jazz. Uh, I I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> just yeah share with your friends tell people about it and um again thank you guys for coming on um okay. we will see you guys on the next podcast goodbye okay all right